Kyle Larson gets his second short track win in three weeks. Meanwhile, Stuart Haas Racing can't cash in on a prime opportunity. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. You're watching Out of the Groove. Welcome to the Paperclip, Martinsville Speedway, Martinsville, Virginia. I'm doing this episode standing up. I don't know that I ever have done an Out of the Groove episode standing up. We've got lots to get to today. We'll talk about Stuart Haas Racing. They were the class of the field for much of this race, leading 246 out of 400 laps. We'll talk about some other teams, some other drivers. Of course, we'll look at the top finishers. We'll put this race on the Groovy Gauge, the debut of the newer 30% less downforce pack at Martinsville. We'll talk about all that and more, but as usual, let's begin with the winner, the finish. Kyle Larson takes two tires during the final pit stop sequence, gets past Joey Logano, gets the victory. Kyle Larson's second win on the season. He joins his teammate, William Byron, two Hendrick Motorsports Chevys. They are the only two-time Cup Series winners so far this season. You could tell listening to Larson post-race, this is not a track he expected to win at, at least not at this point in his career, but Larson and the five team just seemed to progressively get a little bit better as the race went on. They never looked to be way off, but you know, for a while at best they were a top 10 car. At the end though, it was a combination of the right pitch strategy, getting them out on two tires ahead of some of the other fast cars on four. Larson had a great restart and then he patiently worked Joey Logano over in the closing laps to get the win. So great execution by the pit crew, great strategy call by the crew chief, and a good solid drive from Kyle Larson at the end there. They got better as the race went on. I don't think the five at any point was the fastest car in the field, but they were good when it mattered most. And they took advantage of the track position they had uh, created for themselves. So congratulations to Kyle Larson. He and Hendrick Motorsports are continuing to heat up. William Byron was a shocking no-show today. Uh, I think after watching practice yesterday, he was like the best car, best driver on long runs. I thought Byron would for sure be a threat. I don't think he cracked the top 10 once tonight. That was extremely surprising. I know towards the end, it sounded like they were battling some mechanical issues, but Bowman, Looked really fast early on, drove up into the top five. I think he finished 11th, we'll look in a moment. And Chase Elliott, recovering from a broken leg, his first race back, yeah, he ran like 20th most of the day, but he passed like 12 cars during that final green flag run, got up to 10th, he gets a top 10 finish. So Hendrick Motorsports, even when they're not perfect, they find a way to finish better than they run. In the case of Larson, in the case of Elliott, maybe not in the case of Bowman. He, he probably could have finished top five if they played the strategy better, stayed ahead of the track on adjustments. But for the most part, Elliott, Larson, those are the champions over there. They did what they do best. They got good at the end. Larson gets the win. I'm telling y'all, Kyle Larson is dangerous. He could have won Daytona. He could have won Las Vegas. He could have won Phoenix. He was fast at Bristol Dirt last week until you know, Driver made a mistake and then went back and forth with Ryan Priest. But Kyle Larson looking like a championship threat once again. Before we look at the top finishers, I want to talk about Stuart Haas Racing because to me, they were the story of the weekend. Super fast in qualifying. Ryan Priest, flat track phenom, sits on the pole. All four SHR cars qualified inside the top 10. And early Early on, all four of their cars seemed to carry that speed into the race. Ryan Priest led every lap of stage one, won the stage easily. In fact, all four SHR cars finished inside the top six. Ryan Priest led the first, I think, 135 laps of this race. And then I mentioned, as a team, SHR led well over half the laps today. So Stuart Haas Racing had speed. Unfortunately, mistakes ruined at least three of the four drivers' days. Ryan Priest early on, speeding on pit road. And Martinsville, it's always been a track position racetrack, but with this car, this package, we'll talk about in a moment, even more so. Once they got back in traffic, they just never recovered and really struggled for the rest of the race. Kevin Harvick was a serious threat to win until team left a lug nut loose and like the hub or something broke on the car. Under caution, he had to pit a second time to fix that to get a new tire on it. It could have been a whole lot worse. Could have been like what happened to his teammate Eric Almarola at Phoenix a few weeks back instead. Harvick just lost all of his track position late. No chance to recover from that. And then in the case of Chase Briscoe, this mistake wasn't quite as obvious, but why did he take four tires during the final cycle of pit stops? We had seen time and time again that no tires, you're pretty sporty for 20, 30, 40 laps. Two tires, I think he had a great shot. That's what Kyle Larson, the race winner, ultimately opted to go with. Briscoe could have taken two tires himself. He would have been in the exact same position Kyle Larson was in. 
great chance Chase Briscoe drives through the field and wins this race instead. Instead, still a solid top five for Briscoe. Eric Almirola was just kind of around the top five all race. He gets a solid sixth. But to come away with a fifth, a sixth, then your other two drivers were well outside the top 10. That's hugely disappointing if you're Stuart Haas Racing. Today was the best speed that team has shown all year long, collectively, all weekend. From yesterday to today, Stuart Haas Racing looked like their former selves. This looked like 2018 Stuart Haas Racing minus the poor execution. 2018 Stuart Haas Racing, one of their drivers would have won this race, I'm convinced. That's a bummer, missed opportunity for Stuart Haas Racing, and I just don't know how many more of those opportunities this team is gonna get this year. This was the first time, like I said, this team looked this competitive all year. It's been a long, long time, so I'm bummed that an SHR driver did not get the win. Speed-wise, I think they deserved it. Execution-wise, strategy-wise, they blew it. No other way to say it. Let's take a look at some of the top finishers and talk about a very timely caution that bailed a few of these guys out. In stage three, Anthony Alfredo had a wheel fall off in the middle of a green flag pit sequence. Drivers like Joey Logano, who was a lap down at one point early in this race, just did not have speed. Drivers like Martin Truex Jr., Bubba Wallace, who'd had speeding penalties earlier. This caution bailed them out. They got all their track position back and then some. They trapped a few pretty decent cars a lap down, so they never really were a force to be reckoned with at that point. Point. Again, a track position race like this, getting that break was huge. Now, Joey Logano, credit to him, held on to second. He could have faded a whole lot further, but safe to say that team made some good adjustments as the race went on. Martin Truex Jr. pit for four tires, like uh, Chase Briscoe, that final pit stop. But unlike Briscoe, Truex actually went somewhere. Problem was Truex was way further back before the restart, so he had to make up more spots. He got all the way to third. He was practically side by side with Logano for second when they crossed the finish line. And Bubba Wallace squeaked out a top 10. Those were just a few of the notables. That caution hurt drivers like Kevin Harvick who were up front, lost some spots as a result. Denny Hamlin was gonna cycle out to second, I believe, behind Harvick, but with this caution coming out, he was a few spots further back, and it was clear his car, second half of this race, did not handle nearly as well in dirty air. Hamlin still gets a top five, two JGR Toyotas in the top five. Ryan Blaney ends up with the top 10. He was fast early on, started back around 30th, but drove up to like 13th, I think, by the end of stage one. So he was passing cars early, just kind of stalled out once he got near the top 10, it seemed. And hey, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Daytona 500 winner, gets a top 10 as well. I think he was also a beneficiary of that Anthony Alfredo caution. I could be wrong. Either way, good job. Top 10. Round of applause. A few other drivers I'd like to mention. Todd Gillen had finished inside the top 15 four straight weeks. That's fantastic for front row for that 38 car. Was running top 10 today until I think they went down a cylinder, had some sort of engine issue, finished outside the top 20, unfortunately. But Todd Gillen as a driver, that team with their setup, they earned a top 10 finish today. That team has been on fire by their standards, especially the past month. It was great to see that performance continue. I hope that performance can continue to continue despite the you know unlucky, unfortunate result tonight. I didn't see what happened to Tyler Reddick. Why did he finish outside the top 20? Wasn't he top 10 on four tires, the final restart? I'll have to go back and watch a replay, but uh, let me know down in the comments below. Maybe it was something obvious I'm just forgetting, but why did Tyler Reddick fall out of the top 10? Those are your top finishers. Let me know down in the comment section below how your favorite driver did today. If there are any details I missed or I should know about, let me know down in the comment section below. I hope the ambient noise isn't too much. I'm using a different microphone, but you can hear they're still like, I don't know, warming the engines? I, I don't know what they're doing down in the garage. They're still doing something. Anyway, so hopefully it's not too noisy, but let's talk about the racing for just a moment before we put this race on the groovy gauge. Like I said, the new 30% less downforce rules package made its Martinsville debut today. Oh good, they just, they just shut it off. This package was used at Phoenix a few weeks ago. Yeah, maybe the race was a little better. Typical Phoenix, honestly. Richmond a couple weeks ago, I thought it was a great race. I thought it was one of the best Richmond races <laughs> in recent memory. Bristol Dirt last weekend used a version of this package, but that's such a unique beast, it's hard to judge. Today was a huge test because one year ago here, Cup cars put on one of their worst Martinsville shows ever. It was one lane around the bottom, no one could pass, no one could go anywhere. Temperatures were a lot colder, rubber wasn't being laid down, it was a harder tire that Goodyear brought. So besides the aero package, there were already a few other key changes today. It was probably 20, 30 degrees warmer. You could tell there was rubber being laid down. The tire that Goodyear brought was softer than the one they brought here a year ago. It was, I think, the same as what they brought here in the fall. And last fall, the Martinsville race was, I thought, pretty decent. Today's race was 
okay. It was somewhere, I think, in between the spring and the fall. It's probably a little closer to the fall race because the spring race, I mean, that was, again, one of the worst Martinsville races I think any of us have ever seen. Just from a pure quality of racing, ability to move, ability to make moves. For just from that standpoint, it was bad. Today's race, you could pass it. Car drivers could make moves, like I mentioned. Blaney gained 17 spots in the first stage. At the end of this race, Martin Truex Jr. rocketed through the top 10 without much issue. Chase Elliott went from 20th to 10th. Certain drivers could pass at certain points in the run, but you also had moments like Denny Hamlin. Went from leading the race, contending for the win, to back in eighth, back in ninth, dirty air, couldn't go anywhere. Ryan Priest at the end of this race, despite having four fresh tires, could not get up there and pass Logano or Hamlin. So despite rubber being put down, there's clearly like kind of two lanes. Drivers could arc it in differently, use the outside lane to an extent, despite in many ways this looking like typical Martinsville, I think it's safe to say there's still work that could be done to improve the racing here. I just don't know what other changes they could make besides fundamental changes to the next gen. Like a lot of the issues are, you know, bigger brakes, bigger tires, bigger wheels, shifting four times a lap. If you want to change any of those issues, and I'm no engineer, I'm no mechanic, but I imagine you're going to have to make some pretty severe and potentially very expensive edits to the base next gen platform. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Perhaps Goodyear could continue to experiment with an even softer tire. They're always reluctant to do so though because the last thing Goodyear wants is a bunch of their tires blowing out on national television in front of millions of viewers. So they're always gonna go more conservative. They're always gonna play it safe, even if it's at the expense of the on-track racing product. So I don't know what the right answer is. You can't unlearn all the years of aerodynamic development that these teams have learned and been through. Dirty air is always gonna be a problem. How do you take grip away from these cars? It's gonna require massive edits to the next gen, and I fear very expensive edits. So, I don't know. Today's race wasn't bad in many ways. Again, it looked like typical Martinsville, just a little harder to pass than us fans, and I think most all the drivers would like to see. So let's put this thing on the groovy gauge. I love bringing the groovy gauge with me on the road. I'm gonna give today's race a 55%. It was a very average NASCAR Cup Series race. Again, better than last year's spring Martinsville race. I'm not sure it quite lived up to last fall's Martinsville race. It was serviceable, but I think us fans have very, there's a train now. We have very high expectations for short tracks, for Martinsville in particular, and today didn't quite live up to those. So I hope the industry continues to push, continues to try new things. I think they need to tweak the next gen aero rules just about every season to keep teams on their toes, hopefully maintain some level of parity. But on the short tracks in particular, that train <laughs> just keeps interrupting me. On the short tracks in particular, I hope we keep trying new things. I hope there are other, maybe not super expensive solutions we can try out there. I'm not smart enough to know what those are, but you know, I don't think today was good enough. Cup Series can do better and they should strive to do better. That's all I have to say. But 55% uh, for me, what do you think of uh, today's NOCO 400? Been on the road for the past week now. Uh, gonna be home tomorrow, hopefully, so. I'm excited to be home. I got lots of exciting videos to get to work on, to start editing that you all will see in the next few weeks. Thank you for following on with me this past week. I, I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like. If you're new to the channel and you love all things NASCAR, you're in the right place. Hit that subscribe button so you stay in the loop on all the latest stock car racing news. And thank you to my Patreon supporters for continuing to support the show, help keep it growing. I greatly appreciate your support. Thanks for watching. That's gonna do it for me here in uh, Martinsville, Virginia. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, folks.